Hey guys, it's Rift here. How are you all doing today? I'm actually doing pretty well because we're going to be going back to reaction content for a little bit and taking a look at this pretty interesting topic. Has Spider-Man changed? Or more specifically, how has he changed? I'm actually pretty excited for this because I've seen a friend react to it on YouTube. You guys may know him, he's high CHD. And yeah, it's a pretty interesting one. So with that being said, I won't waste any more of your time. Let's get right into it. Miles Morales, the hip new hero that is taking over as the face of Marvel, except he's not new. And just about everything people like about his story are things that we've already seen before. But wasn't the death of his uncle really sad? Yeah, we've seen that before. But it's different because the villain was someone that he cared about. Yeah, we've seen that before. The point I'm trying to make here is that Miles, along with the entire Spider-Verse concept, dilutes the initial appeal of Spider-Man, and Miles can only find success by poaching elements from the original. That's just flat out not true, because there are mo significant differences between Miles and Peter, and Miles and Miguel, and Miles and Gwen, and literally any other Spider character comparing to Peter or Miles or anyone. At the end of the day, just because there's similarities in backstory or similarities in powers, that doesn't mean anything. The whole concept of the Spider-Man in No Way Home is that they all have noticeable similarities. They all have the with great power comes great responsibility aspect. They all got that advice from Uncle Ben or in no, MCU Peter's case, Aunt May, and they all died after giving them that life lesson. They all have strings that tie them together, but that doesn't mean that MCU Peter dilutes anything from Toby Spider-Man, for example. At the end of the day, these are all just adaptations. They take the source material and change it. I don't understand how you can make this comparison when Miguel O'Hara has literally existed since the 60s, yet you don't give a shit about him. Furthermore, the mere existence of this character is contradictory to everything the original Spider-Man stands for. Let me explain. With great power comes great responsibility. That's the phrase that Spider-Man lives by. Even though the movies hate using this phrase for some reason. Well yeah, they do hate this line. I mean, the only time that the great power comes great responsibility line was in Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man 1 and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man 2 and the TASM 2 deleted scenes and in Spider-Man No Way Home. Yeah, what the fuck are you on about? It's not just some fancy quote. It is the main theme that this story revolves around. Uncle Ben dies as a direct result of Peter Parker's inaction. If he doesn't step up and use his powers for good, then innocent people will get hurt. Yeah, this might have been the original origin story for Peter Parker, but are you ignoring the many different adaptations or alternate versions of the character in the comics? I mean, there's literally a version of Spider-Man from Earth 218, I think, where he was literally domestically abused by fucking Uncle Ben, and Wolverine had to come and save his ass. So, yeah, there's different versions in the comics. Again, hyper fixating on one adaptation, debatably the most iconic one, but one adaptation nonetheless and disregarding the others is obviously gonna put holes in your argument. Moreover, this character is a solo act by design. Sure, he'll interact with big teams from time to time, especially during the big events, but he has never been a long-term mainstay on any team, and there is a multitude of reasons for why that is. He's a solo character that occasionally takes place in team-ups, however he's not specifically a team-up character, therefore the solo adventures mean the m What the fuck was the point of that statement? You're basically saying he takes part in team-ups from time to time, but he's predominantly a solo character character, so what the fuck is the point? His strict preservation of his identity makes it difficult for him to get close with his superpowered friends. His home life is a mess, and he would struggle to commit the time to a team, and overall, there are plenty of heroes to take on Avengers level threats. But there are not enough heroes watching over the common man, so Spider-Man prefers to direct his time towards keeping the streets safe. What is it with YouTubers trying to insert their own headcanon for Spider-Man? Number one, this is just focusing on one adaptation of the character but Peter in the comics has shown he is more than willing to help these big teams take on these big threats such as Thanos or you know helping the Fantastic Four. So what is the issue? You're essentially projecting your own views onto a character. But most notably the entire point of this story is about a man who is learning the importance of responsibility. 
responsibility in a world where everything is going wrong, and he is the only one with the power to make a difference. No, Peter has the choice to make a difference, which is the entire with great power becomes great responsibility. He had a choice to capture the guy who killed Uncle Ben, he chose not to, and it led to dire repercussions. Peter, in the original comic tie-in, is not the only one who can make a difference. He himself chooses to do that. Please make a distinction between the two. But in order to make that difference, he must constantly sacrifice his personal life. So his mission throughout his various stories is juggling his time and effort between maintaining these two lives that he lives. So with all this in mind, you may be able to imagine how problematic a second Spider-Man would be to this style of story. Actually, I really don't know, because making sacrifices and maintaining a personal life in addition to your superhero life is literally in the job description for being a superhero. Like, Iron Man has to do that, Batman has to do that, Invincible has to do that, fucking Ben 10 has to do that. The difference, however, is that Peter has limited resources and can't afford to do it as easily as someone like Tony Stark does it. That's the main difference, which is why we're given very fascinating stories with the character. Someone like Miles Morales, those lessons can apply to without taking away from Peter. Oh, he has to make sacrifices to his personal life to do the greater good. Like, how is that taking away from Peter Parker? The modern Peter Parker will take vacations and pass on the mantle, because there is a newer, more powerful, more relatable, better in every way Spider-Man that can just take over the job full time so Peter is no longer needed. I guess this guy never read Spider-Man No More, where there was literally no other Spider-Man helping out, yet Peter decided to give up being Spider-Man anyway to pursue his selfish desires. Or in the Raimi films, for example, or in the Spectacular show. I got this. All of it. Go be Peter Parker for a while. That shit is wrong! Based on what? Your own headcanon? <laughs> Okay, you do you, buddy. But if you remember what we said about great power and great responsibility, you'll know that this flies in the face of everything that Spider-Man stands for. Okay, so I guess you believe the original comic Spider-Man, Spider-Man from the Raimi trilogy, Spider-Man from the new animated series, the original animated series, Spectacular Spider-Man, literally any version that wants to quit being Spider-Man to pursue a selfish, personal life. Apparently, all those versions are bad, according to you. But oh wait, I thought it was modern Spider-Man that were the problem and not the old ones. Ah, my mistake. Peter Parker does not get the luxury of taking a vacation or some half-baked journey of self-reflection because his miraculous powers give him the obligation to protect the innocent and when he doesn't do it, innocent people, often the ones he loves, get hurt. His morals compel him to be Spider-Man at all times, whether he wants to be or not. Yeah, and a quick question, if literally every single Spider-Man, or at the very least the ones that I mentioned, have selfish desires to pursue a personal life, then why is it an issue that a modern Spider-Man also wants to do that? Like, yeah, sure, I agree that some of them is handled poorly, like with the MCU Spider-Man in Far From Home, like that shit's pretty bad, but who cares? At the end of the day, he's not permanently retiring in the Insomniac verse, he's just taking a break. And that is his long-term struggle as a hero that he needs to wrestle with. If you just copy and paste another Spider-Man into the story, with him being someone who knows Peter's identity, shares his same struggles, and can take over the mantle for him at any time, then you are completely missing the point of why this character exists. No, that's really not the case, because first of all, fuck off if you think Miles Morales is just a clone of Peter. If the different powers and ethnicity wasn't enough to convince you. They also have different personalities and different power sets and different backstories. But also, it's literally so stupid. If anything, it's more responsible for Peter in the Insomniac verse to take a break from being Spider-Man when there's another Spider-Man on the scene protecting people than it is in the original timeline and in the Raimi trilogy for the only Spider-Man to just give up indefinitely, potentially fucking over the city. Look in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, didn't crime rate go up by like 75% because the only Spider-Man in that verse quit being a hero? 
Like, it's way more, like, irresponsible for him to do that than Insomniac, so I don't get what the fucking problem is. The concept of multiple Spider-Men has been done before, by the way, so not even that is an original idea that Miles brings to the table. Yeah, you're right, multiple Spider-Men have been a thing since the 60s, so my question to you would be, why the fuck is it all of a sudden a problem for modern Spider-Men to do multiple Spider-Men stories? And naturally, the Spider-Clones of old have fallen to the D-lists of Marvel's roster. Due to the reasons previously stated, Spider-Man's story is inherently a solo act. I think a correct way of saying that would be some of the Spider-Man adaptations have fallen to the D roster. It's pretty obvious that Miles Morales and potentially Miguel O'Hara are more popular, especially in modern times with the Into the Spider-Verse films. Like, Miles is a great character and people like him, same with the Insomniac games, and Miguel O'Hara, he was a pretty fascinating character that if you didn't recognize him from Shattered Dimensions and Edge of Time, you would recognize him from the Spider-Verse films. And stripping away that idea dilutes the appeal of the character. No, it really doesn't. Because at the end of the day, Peter can be a part of the Avengers and still be likable. Like in Infinity War, for example, where Peter had a whole new suit. There was no point in that film where I thought, oh, this film's really fucking good, but Spider-Man sucks because he's a street tier. Or in Insomniac Spider-Man, where they work together to take down greater threats. There was no point where I was like, man, this game's so cool and pushing the limit for technology these days, but it sucks because Miles is helping Peter. Like, no, it's really not that deep, and only fuckers like you are having an issue with it. The closest we've gotten to a successful, well-liked clone was Venom. But Venom is different enough in look and ability to stand out on his own. So many fucking questions. Number one, how is Venom a clone of Spider-Man, and by that logic, why is Miles not able to stand out on his own? His ethnicity's different, his costume's different, even his fucking powers are different, and he has a different backstory. Like, this just, this just screams inconsistent. And he serves a different role in the story, being an anti-villain of sorts. So he never really has the problem of stepping on Spider-Man's toes and replacing him. If you think that Miles is somehow replacing Peter, that's fine, but I hope you keep that same energy for the many, many adaptations of Spider-Man, both Peter Parker and otherwise, that have existed since the 60s. Like, why is this all of a sudden a problem to you? Now, some of you may say, Actually, you're wrong because Miles is a beloved and popular character too. His movies were a big success and people adore his video games. Well, you actually would be right about that to some degree. The numbers don't lie. The Miles-centric movies and video games were all successful. Even I myself enjoyed the first Spider-Verse movie, in spite of having very low expectations going into it. So, what's the problem? Well, the issue lies in the notion that with the inclusion of Miles, the purpose of Spider-Man's story will be forever changed to accommodate his existence. No, it really won't. The only times that will really happen is for stories where Miles is with Peter, but even then it doesn't happen, since in Marvel Spider-Man 2, there are only a couple of examples in the game where they actually work together. Other than that, they've got their own separate side plots to work on. It didn't happen in Spider-Man No Way Home either, like Miles was never mentioned there, and the existence of Miles and, you know, him being a good character all of a sudden had fuck all to do with that film. Like, you're just clutching at straws, trying to defend your notions. The story will no longer revolve around the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. Peter no longer needs to be responsible, because there is plenty of power to go around. In fact, the meaning behind these stories will be much harder to find. The story beats, villains, and themes will either be diluted copies of what we've already seen in Peter's story, with the illusion of high quality coming from the fact that this has already been done before. Bro, like, where the fuck do I begin? Like, he's under the assumption Miles is just a Peter clone and anything that happens for Miles is irrelevant because it's already happened for Peter. It's like, what what the fuck do you expect? For Insomniac Miles, at the very least, he's in the same universe as Peter. So the villains are gonna be similar, but the interactions he has with the villains are different. Like, take Mr. Negative, for example. Miles' arc with Negative is, you know, that of revenge, and letting go of that revenge to be better than that. 
which is something that Peter didn't experience because Peter was dealing with Mr. Negative during the Devil's Breath outbreak when it was never a matter of revenge. So that's an example. Just because Miles interacts with similar villains and shit doesn't mean he's automatically a Peter clone, especially in fucking stories that don't include Miles. Or there will be little to no meaning behind these stories, with the main appeal simply being the surface level coolness of the looks and powers that the Spider-Man possess. And sure, Spider-Man's design and skill set add a lot to his popularity, but it's the depth of Peter Parker's story that makes this character the greatest of all time. Though because of Miles' success, he will likely never go away at this point. If there's ever going to be an attempt to return to the classic Spider-Man story, we likely won't see it for a very long time. And know this, as popular as Miles might be in the moment, his success is a fleeting fad because an imitation can only go so far before it leeches every idea from the original and becomes stale. Yeah, and what is Miles actually leeching from Peter? You've only brought up the Insomniac games and the Spider-Verse films. You've not talked about the comics, and in the films, Miles takes on people that's different from Peter. He fights Kingpin when the multiverse is going to shit, which I'm pretty sure Peter didn't do. He also took on, you know, Miguel O'Hara and, you know, escaped the Spider Society, which is something Peter didn't do. And in the Insomniac games, not only did he have a different backstory, but his interactions with the villains are also different. And you haven't even brought up the comics yet. It's literally just hearsay at this point. You're just waffling on to support an argument, but you're not backing it up with facts. Like, please show me examples of Miles in the comics leeching stories from Peter Parker, like the death of Gwen Stacy arc, for example, or if this be my destiny, or the symbiote suit. Like, please give me examples of him leeching off Peter. You may say, well, Peter Parker's story has been done before, and everyone already knows it now. So the story of Miles is a fresh new spin on a classic tale. I would disagree. You literally got it in one. Everyone knows Peter's story, and therefore Miles's is a breath of fresh air. Like, just because you bring up later on where, oh, there are many comics that never made it to mainstream is irrelevant. Because you can say that for not just Spider-Man, but for fucking everyone. Like... There are so many fucking comic books out there for not just Marvel and DC, but also other verses like IDW, for example, and like different writers. There are so many that didn't make it to mainstream, but that's not an excuse. Just because the Transformers IDW comics never made it to mainstream, that doesn't take it away from the Bayverse films or the Prime show, for example. In regards to the Spider-Verse at large, well, it's annoying to still have to explain why multiverses are bad, but they aren't going away. So here we are again. Adding multiverse stories into a franchise where they previously didn't exist just dilutes the appeal of the original story. No, it really doesn't. Multiverses by themselves aren't bad. The way that they're implemented are bad, however. Like in the comics, for example, it's perfectly fine if given good enough reasoning. In the uh, Insomniac Spider-Man 2 game, same thing. In the animated series where there's like six different fucking Spider-Man working together against Spider-Carnage, it's not a bad thing in that show because it's a one-off and it's explained really well. They're all brought together by forces way beyond their control to stop a greater threat. And makes everything that used to be important feel rather small, inconsequential, and meaningless. And that is especially true in the case of the Spider-Verse. Where Spider-Man was once a brave hero who defied all odds in order to do the right thing, he is now one of many drones who only exist to serve his predetermined fate. Uncle Ben was doomed to die because that's Uncle Ben's cosmic role that reality decided for him. It wasn't because Peter was irresponsible, there is nothing Peter could have done to stop this. It is simply a canon event, bro. Nothing matters. The Spider-Men have have no agency. If one dies, another will spawn to take his place. There is nothing special about Spider-Man. Everyone is Spider-Man. If you like this, then fine, more power to you. But personally, I don't appreciate a Spider-Man that thinks and acts a certain way, simply because that's just what Spider-Men do. I prefer a Spider-Man who has free will, and is constantly tempted to abuse his power, to give up, or to do the wrong thing. I prefer a Spider-Man who has free will, and is constantly tempted to abuse his power, to give up, or to do the wrong thing. My god, he just contradicts his entire point. So according to you, Insomniac Spider-Man is perfectly okay to let Miles, you know, take the reins for a little bit because he has the choice to give up or do the wrong thing, right? 
Like, you just said you prefer that, so you've contradicted your entire point here. There is only one unique and profound Spider-Man. Well, your opinion is fucking trash then, because according to you, literally every single version of Spider-Man can get fucked because the original Steve Ditko version is the best. What kind of logic is this? You're essentially ignoring the merits to literally every Spider-Man adaptation just because they don't quote-unquote follow the rules of the Steve Ditko ones. Even though you contradicted yourself because you yourself said you prefer the Spider-Men that make mistakes so and make selfish desires. So, by your own logic, you like most of the modern adaptations of Spider-Man as well, but the modern adaptations, according to you, are the problem with Spider-Man as a franchise, so make up your fucking mind, which one is it? And that is the way it always should have been. All the others are better off being non-canon what-if stories. And if that were the case with these films, then there would really be no problem with them. But unfortunately, Marvel can't help itself, and feels the need to inject multiverse, spider-verse nonsense into every form of media they control. Uh... Uh, am I gonna have to really go on another rant about adaptations within fiction and how there's like loads of different versions of fucking Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, Iron Man, etc. Like this is literally a thing that happens in fiction. Please stop fucking whining about it. Now while this is meant to be a mile-centric video, there are a few remarks to be made about problems with how Peter Parker is being handled on the rare occasion that Miles isn't around. The two main issues with him are his humor and his competence. No, it's mainly just his writing, because at the end of the day, humor is subjective and competence. I mean, he's a fucking street tier. He's not Superman or Kratos by any means. It's within character for him to get his ass kicked. Like, I swear down, if this guy's about to go on a rant about how Peter was nerfed, I'm actually gonna be done. Also, guys, I just fast-forwarded a little bit of his video where he basically complained about the humor in recent Spider-Man adaptations, such as the Ultimate Spider-Man show or Into the Spider-Verse where he makes wisecracks. Because at the end of the day, humor is subjective. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Let's not lose any sleep over it. Incompetence is the other main issue that plagues this character in the modern era. More often than not, Peter Parker is portrayed as a buffoon, who struggles to overcome most obstacles set before him, and very often needs help from others in order to succeed. This help comes in many different forms, from the Avengers, to other spider people, to friends, to love interests, to even Aunt May of all people. This is one thing I do agree with, the MCU Spider-Man gets helped way too fucking much and he doesn't even try to solve his own problems himself. Up until, you know, the end of No Way Home, where he finally, you know, takes some fucking responsibility. Only took him five years, but hey, better late than never, right? School Spidey put a lot of work into masking his presence, including the way he spoke to others, which was both clever and entertaining to read. His cutthroat roasting skills were also great at getting under the skins of his enemies, and causing them to make mistakes out of losing their tempers. Oh, you mean like Insomniac Spider-Man? You know, a modern adaptation of the character? who, by chatting shit, gets in the head of Shocker and accidentally makes him reveal information about the demons, which gives him a head start at actually learning more about the demons and ultimately stopping them. Yeah, you know how he does that in a modern adaptation? And with his spider sense, that seems to be an increasingly forgotten power these days. Spider-Man has the ability to sense danger prematurely and dodge it before it affects him. It's a very unique defense system that should be very exciting to watch play out in a fight. If it weren't for the fact that this power gets ignored so much, that people will often debate if he even has the power at all in certain movies. Once again, I agree with this. The MCU did a pretty poor job at remembering the spider sense, to the point where he has a little arc in Far From Home where he tries to remember the ability and get it to work. There's even a couple of jokes from Aunt May where she's like, oh, I thought you had the spider sense. Hmm. And then in the final battle where Peter needs to literally force himself to get the ability again. Thankfully, this is fixed in No Way Home where he seems to permanently have the spider sense from then on. But yeah, I agree, the, no the MCU really did treat the Spider-Sense rough. Spider-Man should be nearly untouchable with this power, and this is how he sustains his health while frequently fighting crime. No, just no. The Spider-Sense gives him an advantage in combat compared to enemies as it's a form of precognition, but you are lying to yourself if you think it makes him undodgeable in a fight. If a character scales to Peter in speed or is faster than him, there's a good chance that they can outperform the Spider-Sense. 
hit on Spider-Man should be a big deal that doesn't occur often, and it's up to the villains to find a way around the spider sense if they want to beat him. Or how about this, the villains are just as fast as Spider-Man, if not faster. I mean, it's really not that hard to believe. Fucking Scorpion is, Venom is, Carnage is. When they hit him freely without much effort, then them winning the fight doesn't feel earned. They could team up on him, they could try and trick him, but instead of having that, these movies will just pummel Spider-Man relentlessly, just like any other superhero, and they'll leave him vulnerable to many attacks that should be beneath him, with the stories only giving him this ability whenever it is cinematically convenient. I agree with the notion that the MCU had indeed forgotten the Spider-Sense exists. What I disagree with, however, is your comment towards No Way Home. It's pretty apparent that in Far From Home, he got the ability back in the final battle, and then he kept it from that point forward. Forward. So no, I would disagree with that. And yeah, it's Spider-Sense, not Peter Tingle. Get it right? Come on, Peter Tingle. <sighs> the tingling part of it is a verb, not a noun. My spider sense is tingling. Spider-Man used to be a capable, handsome, intelligent guy who simply had too much on his plate and could just never seem to get life to go his way. Whenever he would solve one problem, five new ones would emerge. He had a loving uncle who died tragically. He has a loving aunt who hates his alter ego. He's constantly hounded by the school bully, so he has a hard time making friends. And he refuses to confront this bully in order to avoid risking letting his identity slip. He barely has any money and never has time for a real job, so he has to settle for a cheap job under a horrible boss. He has had opportunities for great relationships, but his superhero antics always seemed to prevent him from getting close with anyone. It seemed like the world revolved around putting Peter Parker down, but in spite of it all, he would still push forward and do the right thing, because the last time he didn't, he lost his beloved uncle and father figure. So, Insomniac Spider-Man then, right? Right? Like, literally everything you just said applies to Insomniac. The issue here is not that Spider-Man has magically changed, it's whether the writing is competent when discussing the media he is portrayed in. What we get presented with instead is an immature loser who struggles in life despite all the free handouts that he's been given, because he is simply too stupid to make rational decisions. Yes, we understand you don't like Tom Holland's Spider-Man, neither do I, I think he's a dick, he's so intelligent, yet he makes such fucking stupid decisions whenever the plot calls for it. Yes, I agree. Can we skip to a part of the video where you're not repeating yourself? Peter Parker is meant to be a charming, smart, well-rounded, competent person who just so happens to have some of the worst luck imaginable. It's supposed to be believable that women like Mary Jane or Gwen Stacy would find him attractive, even without knowing about his powers. But nah, instead of making that work, they just make MJ either ugly or weird so she can lower her standards. The other reason why this incompetence occurs is because filmmakers and storytellers are so insecure and afraid of turning the love interests into damsels in distress that they are willing to forego logic, consistency, and the story's theme in order to generate shallow girl boss moments that don't actually make these women look cool, they just make everyone else look dumb. Well, the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man films made them look like damsels in distress. Not just MJ, but also Gwen Stacy as well, so I don't know what the fuck you're on about there. And Insomniac Spider-Man MJ, really, this poor bitch can never catch a break. There's always just morons on the internet trashing on her. The reason why she's so competent in the second game is because it's literally stated that Silver Sable, one of the best fighters in the verse, gave her extensive training in hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Like, fucking hell, pay attention to the games, you would know this shit. Fuck me. We knew we had to make her more of a proactive, capable person. And if she's a little OP, I don't give a shit. It's important to have her be a capable hero. You know, this might sound cliche or whatever, cheesy, but like, you don't need to have powers to be a hero. You just don't get it, do you? You don't. Not gonna lie, guys, I didn't even add that clip. He did, but it's actually perfect to what I'm about to say to him. The entire arc that they have in the first game is that even though MJ doesn't have spider powers, she's not made of glass. She still proves multiple times that she can be a part of the plot and assist Spider-Man in his missions, even if it's as a side character or behind the scenes. Like, it's literally the arc in the first game. 
and it's even part of their character before the PS4 game begins because they broke up because Peter was too overprotective of her. Pay attention, use your fucking brain. Back in the day, he could handle not just one, but multiple major supervillains at one time. Heck, in the first time he encountered the X-Men, he handled the entire team by himself without too much trouble. And that's no one-off outlier either, that used to just be normal for him. This guy was supposed to be very hard to put down. He needed to finish fights by himself, because he usually never had the luxury of relying on others. And speaking of agendas, I hope you can appreciate me not talking about the race of Miles this entire time, because that is not what this is about, and I didn't need to mention it to make my argument. But there is something that is worth asking, can you also avoid that topic while justifying why Miles should stick around? Wait, so let me get this straight, you think that people believe that the only reason Miles should stay around is just to push agendas? First of all, it's not even pushing an agenda in Spider-Man 2, the Black Lives Matter thing. At the end of the day, the game takes place in 2020 New York City. Like, when these movements happen. Like, it would be less realistic for these elements to not be part of a modern portrayal of New York City. Like, I don't know where you're going with this. And if anything, it just makes you sound passive-aggressive, like, oh, you only think Miles should stay around because you think it's pushing an agenda. It's like, no, he's not a black clone of Peter, he has different abilities, like, that's fucking stupid. Between not using his powers right, not getting his personality right, and not understanding his moral foundation, the modern interpretation of Spider-Man seems to be getting increasingly detached from the roots that made him famous. And some of you detractors may say, well, the character has to change with the times. And even though things are different now, doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad. This is a new Spider-Man for a new era, and there is some truth to that. Not all new Spider-Man stories are bad, they're merely different. But be that as it may, I personally prefer the Spider-Man of old. I like what he did, I like how he acted, I like what he represented. If we are coming to an age where the classic Spider-Man is outdated, and this new guy and his replacement are here to stay, then fine. I guess Spider-Man is no longer for people like me. I no longer have any interest in reading any more of his comics, watching any more of his movies, or playing any more of his games. My fucking god, the salt levels are real. What, just because Spider-Man quote-unquote isn't as strong anymore, you're gonna stop engaging with them? What, just because he has a black sidekick in the games, you're gonna, like, disregard playing them? Even though Miles is very likable and very much his own character? What, just because he engages with alternate Spider-Man in the films, you're gonna just instantly shut off your brain to him? Like, you're- the entire- the- oh, fucking hell. Like, this entire time you were talking about, oh, the life lessons and the choices of Spider-Man, yet all of a sudden, just because he's weaker and he occasionally has help, you're gonna just say, alright, this character isn't me, fuck him. Even though you yourself admit that he has done team-ups in the past, he has done collabs, and like, in Spider-Man 2, for example, it's not like Miles holds his hand throughout the entire game, or vice versa, like, no. They team up, like, maybe three or four times, and then apart from that, they have their own arcs and characters stories, which, I mean, you would know if you played and engaged with the games, I guess. But anyways, guys, that's all from me for today. If you enjoyed this video, then feel free to like it if you did. If you didn't like it, then don't. Subscribe, it really helps the channel. Please don't send any hate over to this guy, it's really unnecessary. Hang around on the channel for live streams and all the rest of it, that'd be great. And I will see you all in the next one.